Okay, good afternoon. We have uh, only one more session today, uh, and it's on individuality and individuation. In some sense, I think this will be a review of many of the things we've discussed in the last previous five days, four and a half days, but I hope to put it together in a way that maybe ties some of the not. We've been talking about some very formidable individuals, uh, whether it's Steve Jobs who created the most valuable company in the world, or Abraham Lincoln who maybe we could say created the most created the most powerful nation in the world, uh, at least kept it together. Uh, so I wanted to emphasize the fact that individuality is a phenomenon that exists at all levels of society and uh, it doesn't, we don't have to be a Mahatma Gandhi uh, or a Martin Luther King to show aspects or expressions or characteristics of individuality. And uh, for that I have an example of a young farmer in South India uh, whose father owned three and a half acres of land and at the age of 18 this, uh, his son came to him and he said, uh, Father I want to set out on my own, which itself is very unusual in the Indian context because the idea would be a son would stay with the parent and farm the property. and. Uh, the father says, well, what do you want to do and how are you going to do it? I don't have any money I can give you. He said, I want one acre of land. Well, what can you possibly do with one acre of land uh, to set out on your own? He said, no, I want to grow, I, I can't actually have one acre of land, a half an acre of land, he said. Uh, I'm going to grow jasmine flowers. And uh, he showed his father, according to his calculations, uh, that he could earn from a half an acre of jasmine uh, as much as his father's earning from three and a half or four acres or even five acres of normal land. And so his father agreed and the boy set out and cultivated jasmine. Now this was not a crop that was grown commonly in his area and there was good, very good demand for jasmine flowers. The South Indians love flowers. They use them in the temples. The ladies wear them, the girls and the women wear them in their hair. Uh, so there's a great demand and a good price. And uh, in the third year he had a good crop of jasmine and he was making quite a lot of money. He was making more money than his father was making from the other three acres of land. And pretty soon the other farmers in the village uh, decided that, that they should imitate him and so a lot of them began to grow jasmine also. And this boy was selling the jasmine locally uh, at a high price. But when other farmers in the village started to grow the same crop, the price began to go down because there were more people available. So he found that if he goes 50 miles away, the nearest real, 30 miles away to the nearest market town, he can earn more, get a higher price for it. So he started daily taking his flowers, going by bus and selling them in the town. And he started offering the other farmers in the village that he would buy their flowers for a little more than the local merchant was uh, buying them and they all agreed and so suddenly instead of having the production from half an acre of jasmine he had the production from about 10 acres of jasmine and he was making more money uh, because he was selling it at a higher price in a market town. Well, after a while, the other farmers said, uh, this boy must think we're stupid. Uh, he's buying our crop jasmine at a cheap price and selling it uh, uh, in a town called Dindigo, which was 30 miles away, 
uh, we'll also go to Bindigal and get the same price he is. Why should he get all the profit? And so the boy went to Madras, which was about 150 miles away, and contacted a jasmine uh, uh, wholesaler there and found out in Madras the price is much higher. So he went back to the farm and offered to buy from the farmers in the village at a price that they would get if they sold it in Bindigo. And he started arranging to take the flowers to Madras. And his business was growing. He was able to buy more flowers. He was able to get a higher profit. After some time, some of the other villagers said, if this man is paying us so much, it must be because he's earning even more from this. So somebody followed him and found out that he, where he was selling it in uh, uh, Madras, and uh, they started competing with him and going to Madras also. The boy made inquiries in the Madras market and found out that the real market for the flowers was not just so much in Madras, but they fetched a much higher price in Bangalore, which was 150 miles to the east, and a lot of these flowers from Madras were being shipped by the wholesaler to Bangalore. So he went to Bangalore and found out a much higher price. And he went back to the village and he offered to buy the flowers from everybody there uh, for the price that they were getting, less their costs and a little effort, uh, by selling them in Madras. And meanwhile, he was spreading out his buying, so it was over a larger and larger area. And he was sending flowers direct to Bangalore. And by this time, the boy had become really prosperous, I mean, for his level, considering where he started from. And again, the villagers said, this boy's not doing anything to favor us. Uh, if he's getting a higher price, they followed him and found out uh, that he was uh, going to Bangalore and had a merchants there. So they organized also to sell their flowers directly to uh, Bangalore. And he found out, the boy found out that in Bangalore, that a lot of these flowers were being exported by plane to Singapore. Now here's an uneducated boy, who just had a high school education. He flew to Singapore, and he went to the flower markets there, and he started negotiating with the flower merchants that are importing jasmine flowers from Bangalore, which originally came from Dindigo and Chennai. And uh, he offered to supply directly uh, to the man, uh, and the merchant there said, well, if you're going to bring so many jasmine flowers, uh, there are some other things I'd be interested in. <laughs> and pretty soon this young guy, by that this time maybe at the age of 23 or something like that, uh, was exporting a variety of products from here to, uh, to Singapore. And after that I lost track of him. But here's a Here's somebody who shows some of the fundamental characteristics of individuality, that he doesn't wait to see and do what everybody else is doing. He doesn't confine his attitudes or his expectations or his sense of possibilities to what other people have. The essence of individuality is the capacity to rise above social conventions and the sense of limits within which our social construction of reality imposes on each of us and we each have them and we don't recognize how far we're living within conceptual boundaries that are perceptual boundaries that are really not uh, 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 permanent or physical or final determinants for us. So I like the story for that reason. So, what is individuality? And we've been talking about it for four and a half days, and I think there's nothing much new to say, but I wanted to try to summarize some of the things we've heard. To think beyond, the capacity to think beyond conventional wisdom. To conceive of accomplishing what no one else has or believes can be accomplished. I think of Steve Jobs when I say this. Uh, especially when it came to the iPod and iTunes and making converting Apple into a music company, he really did something that nobody believed was possible. Uh, Bill Gates had the honesty to say even after the fact that he never could figure out how uh, Jobs did it, let alone 
uh, before the fact. To rely on one's own understanding, thinking, judgment, and conviction. It doesn't mean we refuse to listen to anybody else or learn from anybody else, but we refuse to be limited by what other people understand. To decide for oneself to do what is right, stand for what we believe. To act according to one's highest values and convictions. To make a unique contribution to society that changes something fundamental. Now, why that should be there, uh, I will come back to that. I'd like to relate just one more story of an individual who made a unique contribution to, some, to society that changed something fundamental. In 1907, the U.S. was subjected to one of the periodic and very critical financial crises that had been coming in the country ever since the 1830s or so. Uh, at, by that time, the U.S. had about 21,000 banks functioning, but absolutely no regulatory mechanism. What we call the Federal Reserve System today, uh, with I think our 12 Federal Reserve Banks and highly regulated environment, it didn't exist. There was no centralized governance of the banks at that time. In fact, uh, most of the banks operated independently from one another, and something that uh, many people don't know, until near the end of the 19th century, we had 6,000 banks in America that were issuing their own currency. When we say this is, we call, we used to call the dollar a banknote. Why it was called a banknote? Because money used to be issued by banks, not by the government. We had 6,000 banks issuing their own money, and it was a big chaotic uh, system. Uh, your money, if, if you use the currency, it would work pretty well in the local community. But if you go 100 miles away, people will already be suspicious of that money. And if you go 500 miles away, people will say, well, this doesn't, this is useless. And there were only a handful of banks that had a reputation where their currency would be accepted everywhere. Well, in 1907, we had a major financial crisis equal in, mesh, in magnitude to what happened at the time of the Great Crash in terms of the uh, and in the panic we were, I was talking about with FDR. Uh, but because there was no system that could support this, the whole responsibility for handling this crisis ultimately fell on the shoulders of one man, and his name was J.P. Morgan, a, man, a name that uh, uh, probably everybody has heard about. And Morgan was, uh, he was the founder of U.S. Steel. He was a businessman uh, of several generations. He was relatively wealthy, though, according to the testimony of John D. Rockefeller, who owned Standard Oil, Morgan wasn't even a rich man by his standards. But by typical standards, he was. But the real thing that distinguished J.P. Morgan was he was a man whose reputation was so strong that virtually anyone in America and even in Europe would be willing to take him on his promise. His, at that time, credit was based on the integrity and the reputation and the trustworthiness of an individual, not even of an institution. And Morgan had a famous uh, uh, statement he used to say that character determines credit. The character of the individual determines credit. This was a man who was definitely in business to make money, but he was more trusted than any other businessman because of his high ethical standards and sense of integrity. At the time when the banking system in New York was in panic, the stock exchange was collapsing. He called together with no authority. He had absolutely no authority to do this. He called together all the top banks in New York, and he said, we're going to go through and decide which of the banks can be saved and which of the banks cannot be. And he appointed a six-man committee, and in a matter of a couple of days, they reviewed the financial statements of the banks and decides which ones they could save and which ones would have to be allowed to go bankrupt. 
The situation was so severe that the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange came to Morgan and said that because of the failure of the banks, uh, there's a, we are not able to meet our buy-sell commitments on the stock exchange. And if we don't get another $25 million, which was a lot of money at that time, within the next one and a half hours, uh, we're going to have to close the exchange, and I'm afraid that means everything will just collapse. The whole market will collapse. So uh, Morgan called all the banks together, and he said, I need $25 million right now in the next 30 minutes. And uh, they collected a commitment of uh, $25 million and informed the president of the stock exchange. The exchange was going to be open for one more hour. He needed to have enough money to meet all the buy-sell orders for that hour. And in the first half an hour, $23 million of it was law, was absorbed uh, by the exchange. So, but it stemmed the panic of selling and they managed to complete the hour without panic. And the next week, the crisis subsided. This event made such a big impact on the country and the government that after that they said, we cannot rely on a single individual <laughs> to be saving our system. And anyway, he's an old man. What's going to happen the next time around? Nobody else could have done it. We're going to have to find a, a solution for this. So five years later, they created the U.S. Federal Reserve. And it was really to take, it's very interesting because it was to institutionalize what one man had done. What one man had done on the strength of his character, his personality, they created a social institution that should be able to do this in the future. So that's really the power of the individual. Uh, uh, to affect the society. And I like this quote from Carl Jung, resistance to the organized mass can be affected only by the man who is as well organized in his personality, in his individuality, as the mass itself. So individuality is, though it's a, a difficult thing for us to define, it is an organization of personality that's, a, that's so strong, so well developed, it's able to uh, match the organization of the society. I think uh, in a course where individuality is a core theme, we could have started the first day with definitions, but I think the definitions will even be more meaningful now, so I, I postponed it. We've got four words here that sound very, very similar to one another uh, and can easily be uh, used interchangeably. The first is individual, and in English, I mentioned the first day, the word individual can represent simply a single member of the society, a separate person. It doesn't necessarily denote anything unique about the person. And then we've got a phrase often used interchangeably with individuality, individualism. But individualism is really a social philosophy. And uh, I, I define it this way, an outlook based on self-reliance, independence, and very often self-centered egoism. A social philosophy favoring individual freedom over state control. So when we talk about individuality, most people very often are thinking about individualism. One of the things you would have noted in uh, uh, what Alberto was presenting about Carl Rogers uh, and other quotes we've had is the individual, individuality is not, we're not talking about this phenomenon of uh, rugged individualism, every person for themselves, everybody looking out for themselves uh, and uh, not worrying about anybody else. That's a philosophy and that's been there and that is there among many people, but that's not what we mean by the word individuality. By individuality, we mean that which does not depend on social authority or tend towards social conformity for its own sake. It doesn't mean we don't conform. I mean, if, if I believe in what the society believes in, 
Uh, my conforming with the society is because I believe in it myself, not just because the society believes in it or says it's true. So it's, the, it's a capacity for original inspiration, creativity, and uniqueness of expression. I think it was Alberto who made a comment a couple of days ago, or maybe it was a question, I'm not sure, uh, I don't recall, but uh, about uh, uh, is individuality evolving? And I thought that's a very interesting question. Individuality has been around as, far, as long as at least recorded histories have been around. We've always had examples of exceptional individuals who changed the world. From the time of Moses and Buddha and Socrates, Confucius and Christ and Caesar and Augustus Caesar and so forth uh, and so on. Uh, there have always been individuals. But society, most societies have not valued the development of individuality or encouraged it. In fact, that's been quite rare. Uh, conformity to the social traditions, conformity to social convention, has been the normal characteristic of society in the past. And I quote it because we tend to think about ancient Greece as a, as a, a, a society uh, of highly individualistic, and in fact, uh, there was the birth of individuality there. But even a man like Aristotle believed that the natural life of the person was, as part of the institutional life of society, he could not, uh, not define by himself, by defined by the fact that he's a member of the Athenian society. There was a greater emphasis on his participation in the collective than anything unique about him as an individual. Well, whatever there was in ancient Greece, we know that after the fall of the Roman Empire, during the Middle Ages, the idea of individuality in Europe, at least, was pretty well blotted out. Uh, the, the church insisted on, uh, the, actually they discouraged education, uh, uh, they burned uh, libraries, uh, the idea of having a unique opinion of things or having a creative artistic uh, work uh, according to any individual inspiration was pretty much banished for many centuries. Uh, but then we see, sorry, I'll go back to Greece for a minute because uh, uh, during the Greek period we did have the rise of individualism. Uh, the individual became the natural unit uh, no longer is the person justified as a part of the group. Freedom for the individual became an idea. The inner life is very much valued in uh, the, the, uh, the Hellenic literature. Ethics, the ethical dilemma of the individual to choose what's right for himself. The value of privacy, ideas of freedom. Education of the intellect of the individual, these all became important. But then it eclipsed for about 1,300, 1,400 years until the Italian Renaissance, which Alberto mentioned yesterday. And then we see this idea of individuality coming up again. Freedom for individual self-expression. Individuality of faith, uh, that each person could know for themselves and decide for themselves. Individual conscience became more important than the church authority. Even in Catholicism, individual repentance, individual confession, individual salvation, individual interpretations of the Gospels all gained legitimacy, which they hadn't had in previous centuries. In art, the classical art of the Middle Ages is all stereotyped art. You can only portray things in a stereotyped fashion according to uh, a standard. We see personal uh, variation coming, the artistic variation of the Renaissance. You could choose as subject matters not only religious uh, themes for your art, but uh, individuals could be painted. We have the great, uh, the Mona Lisa, which is so intriguing because uh, Leonardo has painted and portrayed an individual, not according to a stereotype, and we wonder who she is and what she's smiling about. <laughs> And, and what it's all about. Autobiography uh, became popular uh, uh, 
for the first time in, in, in Western uh, tradition. Uh, individual appearance, which had been uh, rejected in the asceticism of the Middle Ages, that you shouldn't worry about your appearance, suddenly bathing became important. Your clothes became more uh, important. And the ideal of romantic love, of courtly love, uh, which is not there uh, through much of the tradition, this idea of the heroic love of one individual for another, uh, as later embodied by Shakespeare in uh, a number of his plays, like Romeo and Juliet, it was born of this period. And all that we talk about individuality today traces its steps back to the Italian Renaissance. And I've just marked some of the, the things that happened after that, which helped build on our concept of modern individuality. The printing press, which enabled us to disseminate information and get access to it, which enabled anybody uh, to have a copy of the Bible. Uh, it was no longer rare. Uh, the Protestant Reformation, which uh, said that anybody can interpret the Bible for themselves and we need not be dependent on the priesthood. The Enlightenment, where questioning of age-old beliefs and subjecting them to scientific procedure. The rise of democracy in the parliament, which essentially says all power and determination is not with the mind. The Declaration of Independence, which said all men are created equal, endowed with inalienable rights, and so forth. And that goes to the universalization of education, universal suffrage, the rise of the middle class, universal human rights. These are all unprecedented steps in the evolution of humanity, which I think point to the fact that individuality, in the sense that we're talking about it, is an evolving concept. Carl Jung, who was certainly one of the great psychologists of the 20th century, he spoke and wrote a lot about this process, the process of becoming an individual. And he talks about three processes. One, development. Development of consciousness out of the original state of psychological identity with the collective, in which we are all identified with the collective inheritance and don't really have a, a, an individual identity. Differentiation, by which we differentiate ourselves from the social uh, milieu in which we live. We become aware of our own innate potentials and not just the potentials of the society. And what he called transformation of personality to reach higher level of consciousness. He said, I am not what happened to me. I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. That is the essence of individuality. Jung also wrote about the relationship between the individual and the society. I think something that we covered pretty much this week. The individual is one who chooses not to be limited by collective norms. The word limited is important here. The individual does not live isolated, separate existence, but as a preeminent member of the collective. Society is essential, he argued, for the flowering and development of the individual, individuality. Individuality cannot fully reach its potential outside of society because we thrive and grow by our interaction with other human beings and the challenges of being part of society. We are not whole when we live in isolation. At the same time, the individual is indispensable for the development of the society, which has been one of the main themes uh, of, uh, of our discussions uh, during this week. And the individual gives conscious expression to the needs and aspirations of the society, the way Mahatma Gandhi did, Lincoln did, Jobs did in his own way, uh, FDR did, and so forth. Abraham Maslow, another great humanist psychology, I like this quote from him, he says, it looks as if there were a single ultimate goal for mankind, a far goal towards which all persons strive. 
This is what we variously call by different authors self-actualization, self-realization, integration, psychological health, individuation, autonomy, creativity, productivity. But what they all agree that this amounts to realizing the potentials of the person. And this is what Alberto was talking about uh, as Rogers thought. That is to say, becoming fully human, everything that a person can become. So when we talk about individuality, we mean some individuation, somebody who's becoming more of what they're capable of becoming and what each of us is capable to becoming in our own way. Maslow also gave his version of the characteristics of the self-actualized individual very similar to uh, uh, to what Alberto presented from Rogers, and I'm just putting them up here for comparison so you can see this is not just one uh, view. This was a, a shared perception of some very imminent, far-sighted, perceptive thinkers. A self-actualized individual is one who becomes aware of his potential and chooses to aspire for what he thinks is right with self-confidence and self-respect even if it requires him to break social convention. The self-actualized individual is not egoistic, egocentric, and selfish. His central characteristic is uniqueness. The individual and the collective are complementary. The individual lives in harmony with himself, the really the actualized individual, that is, and the collective. One of my favorite poets when I was growing up, an American uh, poet, E.E. Cummings, who was very much an individual, to be nobody but yourself in a world which is doing its best day and night to make you like everybody else means to fight the hardest battle which any human being can fight and never stop fighting. It's easy, especially if you read somebody like Cummings, who maybe was somewhat not only of an individual, but somewhat of a rebel at the same time, to get the, it's not quite clear, what is the relationship between individuality and rebellion? It kind of sounds, in the, in the 1960s, during the hippie movement, which was my generation and Alberto's generation, uh, I think maybe I mentioned here, we all felt that we were becoming individuals by re rebelling against all that our parents did and all the way they behaved. My father wore a suit and a tie to, uh, to the office every day and uh, uh, they behaved in a certain way. Uh, so we grew long hair and beards and wore blue jeans and uh, uh, looked as if we didn't care what we looked like and, uh, and all. Uh, but. I learned much later, I thought I was being very individualistic when I was doing all of that and frowning on some lone person who had the courage to walk down the street in Berkeley with a tie on. <laughs> Maybe he was the real individual. <laughs> Only later I reflected uh, that I had taken one form of conformity <laughs> for another and it felt very comfortable to be living in Berkeley in blue jeans and long hair. I was accepted because of that. So it made me think about what this uh, individuality really is. I said, conformity is submission to the authority of social convention, regardless of which social convention is, whether imposed from outside or conditioned from inside. Nonconformity is the capacity to resist the pressure to adopt society's norms. But nonconformity doesn't necessarily mean individuality. Rebellion is a reaction against the pressure to conform. I call it negative conformity. If you say one thing and I feel I have to disagree with you because I want to rebel, so I say the opposite thing, I think I'm being very individualistic. But actually, I'm just, it's a mirror image. <laughs> it's just a reverse image. It's not really individuality at all. And a lot of rebellion and nonconformity is confused for something much more sophisticated we're talking about when we talk about individuality. That's why I stressed earlier, the individual may conform. He may conform in many ways with everybody else, but he conforms because he believes it's right and he knows why he's doing it, 
not because he needs the gratification of acceptance from the society. So he has the capacity to act freely, unconstrained by inner conditioning or external social pressure, according to what? According to his highest understanding, his ideals, his values, his creative inspiration. I quoted here from Steve Jobs, I think I paraphrased it earlier. This came from his commencement speech at Stanford University about 10 years ago, which he told the graduating class, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you, are, you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. And if you've never heard the speech, it's available on YouTube, the Stanford commencement speech. It's much longer and uh, quite, in, quite inspiring. We talked this morning about uh, authority and uh, autonomy uh, and uh, empowerment, and what is the relationship of the individual to authority? Individuality, my understanding is individuality involves an internalization of authority. The individual is not one who lives in a totally uninhibited state, uh, un, uh, uh, restricted by any type of discipline. He has internalized his values and lives according to a, a hot, can be a very high level of discipline and a high level of authority, but it's that of his own values, it's that of his own ideals, it's that of his own sense of what's right, uh, not just because somebody else says it's right. Uh, but it doesn't mean uh, that he uh, isn't bound by a very high ethic. The individual internalizes society's values too, either to own them as his own, because he believes in them, or to reject them in favor of something else. He dares to question, he or she, dares to question existing norms and beliefs, and dares to think or believe what is impossible or unacceptable to the society. And I like this last one very much. Individuals are able to see the unrealized is not necessarily unrealizable. I'm going to come back to it tomorrow. What has not ever been done, just because it hasn't been done, doesn't mean it can't be done. And that's one of the characteristics of individuality, because for those of us who are not very individualistic, the moment we think of something, we want to know whether anybody's done it before. The courage to say, I don't care whether anybody's done it before, I say it can be done. That's why I like the story of Around the World in 80 Days, where Phileas Fogg was really an individual when he says he can, he can go around in 80 days. How many people have done it before? That's not his question. His understanding and assessment was it can be done, and he did it. I did include Carl Rogers here because I thought he says it maybe better than anyone else in that he has a more comprehensive view. I'm not going to read it all again because it's been uh, spoken, but just to show you everything... Uh, that we've been talking is here too. And I like this quote from Rogers, individuation is an ongoing process that is an end in itself, the most profound truth about man. So individuation is not just a way to get something else or to accomplish something else, which it does do. It is itself maybe the highest goal, that's what uh, Maslow was saying, uh, and the profoundest aim that we can pursue. Having talked about it as if individuality is one thing, I think it's also obvious that every individual we talk about is different, and there are many different types of individuals. We have individuals who are pioneers and explorers who sailed around the world, individuals who were physical individuals. They had the courage to, like a Columbus or a Magellan or whoever they were, uh, Vasco da Gama, to believe they could do something physically that nobody had done before. We have entrepreneurs as individuals. Uh, we have leaders like a Gandhi or a Genghis Khan or a 
Churchill or an FDR. They're all different types of individuals, but they all fit this general description. They all meet the same criteria. They weren't limited by what other people thought. They weren't limited by what other people believed. And of course, we have mental individuals like an Einstein or a Socrates uh, and spiritual individuals like a Buddha uh, who uh, transcended uh, all conceptions uh, uh, in his own life, in his, the path he charted out for himself. This man was certainly, by any standard, one of the great individuals of the last few thousand years that we know about. Leonardo da Vinci, he's the real Renaissance man, uh, or polymath. Uh, he had an unquenchable curiosity and feverish uh, imagination. He's one of the greatest painters of all time, but painting was only one of his many capacities. He was a sculptor, an architect, a musician, a mathematician, an engineer, an inventor, an atomatist, a geologist, a cartographer, a botanist, and a writer. He did very famous anatomical studies of the human body, which were centuries ahead of his time, his knowledge of anatomy. He also uh, was a great inventor. He has an early design for something that looks like solar, a solar power collect, energy collector, an adding machine, a flying machine, a parachute, a helicopter tank, uh, military tank, uh, and uh, I don't know what this cannot means, that's a mistake or something, but uh, uh, cannot, can, cannot, should be cannot. Uh, and uh, he designed a single span bridge uh, uh, that was supposed to be erected over the Bosporus. Uh, uh, it was never built, but it was according to a design that was later built and tested and proven to be uh, a, a, a perfect engineering. So. Of course, this is at the, the highest level. One of the things we see about individuals is that they're highly creative. And I like to think of the uh, act of creativity as an act of objectification. What do I mean by that? To objectify is to create something as an object. And the individual creates as an object something that's there as potential in himself. Leonardo had the inspiration to create the Mona Lisa or the Last Supper. Uh, those were the objects that manifested his, gave expression to his individuality. For Washington, it was his contribution to creating a democratic America. To Morgan, a stable economy. To Gandhi, an independent India. These were not just outer world to him, to them, to him, they were extensions of their personality. To Marion, it was a vibrant company. Steve Jobs, it was perfect products. To Jane Austen, it was what I would say a near perfect novel, <laughs> Pride and Prejudice. To Beethoven, his Ninth Symphony, and so forth and so on. And this act of objectification, of translating inner potential into outer form, is itself an act that's of self, that gives a joy, that gives a fulfillment. It's a self-rewarding act of creativity. Creative individuals not only tap their own inner potential, but as we've seen in previous examples, they also tap the potentials of the society. Morgan didn't single-handedly save the system. He united competitors to work in a cooperative way and form the rudimentary basis for what became the Federal Reserve System. That potential was there in the society. It took an individual to harness it and bring it out and give it a form. FDR didn't single-handedly save the banking system in 1933. He appealed to the faith and courage and confidence of the American people, which was there but not after, and brought it to the fore and helped it to act. He was a catalyst of making this happen. Jobs didn't invent the microprocessor or the computer or any uh, other thing. He gave form to the technologies of the period 
to better suit the needs and aspirations of the society. I think the, the growth of individuality starts with, as it does for all of us, with our experience. Experience is the raw material for all our progress. The thing that distinguishes the individual, Alberto mentioned it yesterday as one of the defining criteria for the self, uh, uh, the fully functional individual, the fully functional individual learns from his experience and continues. It's not that he doesn't make mistakes. He continuously learns and does it better. Experience presents us with the challenges that Janani was talking about that draw out our unformed human potential. Just like a sculptor chisels the stone away to reveal the form that's hidden in the rock. We have that. We have that potential individuality in us, all of us do. Our interactions with life and each other are the, the sculptor's knife which helps to chip away and give form so that what's hidden below the surface can come out. One of the things I've come to appreciate more and more, and as a psychologist Alberto is constantly referring to it is, but maybe because of my American heritage, I never understood it intellectually when I was growing up, even when I was studying psychology. And that is how important the interaction with other human beings is to our development as a human being. Uh, how much we learn, even by the people who irritate us, by the people who dislike us, by the people who insult us, and one of the things I love best about the story of Pride and Prejudice is Darcy, who's the hero, who starts off as a very smug, self-centered, selfish, self-important, boorish aristocrat. The great progress he makes, he makes because his childhood companion, Wickham, tells lies about him calls him a scoundrel and accuses him of things that Darcy never did, that Wickham claims that Darcy stole his inheritance and deprived him of his birthright. Everything was quite the opposite of that. But how much Darcy is benefited by the fact that these false accusations were made from about him. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth, who likes Wickham, believes all the lies that Wickham told her, and when Darcy proposes to Elizabeth the first time, which I played that uh, episode, she accuses him of all these things which are totally false. She never would have, I mean, she was not a person to speak meanly to anybody. If she hadn't believed that he's a real abomination, she never would have had the courage to tell him you're mean and foolish and boorish, which is true, which was true. It was the strength of Wickham's lies that she believed gave her the courage to speak out fully because she felt this man is so heartless that he won't care what I say. And he had the courage not to say, oh, Wickham has told you a bunch of lies and you are foolish enough just because he's handsome to believe it. Instead of saying that, he sifted through, ignored what wasn't relevant, and saw that essentially what she was saying about him was true. And at the end, when they meet again, and uh, he proposes to her the second time, he says, after all, what did you tell me that wasn't true? They were bitter lessons, but uh, you did me a great service. So the individual has the capacity to take things, whether they're packaged pleasantly or packaged very unpleasantly, and discover what's the truth in them for us. I asked this question on the first morning when I was giving the example of Steve Jobs achieving at such a high level. I said, what is the source of the individual's power? And we've come back to it several times. Uh, the source of the power of the individual is not some unique thing in this person that's different from everybody else. The source of the power of the individual to accomplish is the power of the society. 
if the individual plugs into the society, relates to the society in a constructive way, understands its needs, identifies with its aspirations, and helps it to accomplish more as its catalyst. So when you look at these great individuals, it's not that they're a hundred or a thousand times greater or better than other people. It's that they tune in so that the power of society can flow and express through them for the betterment of the society. Alan Watts was a, a, a mystic of our generation who uh, Alberto had the personal uh, uh, opportunity to know. I never did, though. I read his books. Uh, uh, he, I like this. He talks about the relationship between the individual and the universe. He said, every individual is a unique manifestation of the whole, as every branch is a particular outreaching of the truth. To manifest individuality, every branch must have a sensitive connection with the tree. You can't be a real individual if you're not related to the rest of the tree, uh, which is the universe for us. Just as our independently moving and differentiated fingers must have a sensitive connection with the whole body. Differentiation is not separation. The head and the feet are different, but not separate. And though man is not connected to the universe by exactly the same physical relationship as the branch to tree or feet to head, he's nonetheless connected, and by physical relations of fascinating complexity. So all the quotes everybody says about the individual, this is a highly connected person, not an isolated uh, or separated uh, person. On evolution of individuality, Rollo May says, human development is a continuum of differentiation from the mass, from undifferentiated mass towards freedom and integration. It's not enough freedom. There's got to be integration around an individual center. That's what I was talking about as an organization. And he talks about the whole of individual progress as an evolution towards individuality. And so I raised the question uh, that Alberto raised earlier, is humanity evolving? And I mentioned a few days ago this quote, this uh, Charles Fourier, the French philosopher, who said one day we would have 37 million poets like Homer, mathematicians like Newton, dramatists like Moliere, uh, when I first read it, it just sounded like a fantastic something out of the blue. But when I thought maybe this is a man who really had a vision of the human potential and the evolution of individuality, well, it doesn't sound so uh, uh, far out as it did then. And, uh, you know, if you look back, one of my famous, favorite painters is Monet, the Impressionist uh, painter. If you see the kind of painting that's being done in the U.S., uh, and I'm just saying U.S. because I know it better, but among the younger people today, uh, I've seen hundreds of artists who paint things that to me look as beautiful uh, as the Monet. Uh, and I don't appreciate Monet in any way, but I think what was done by one outstanding person as a genius uh, set in creating a new style 150 years ago, 120 years ago. Today, that talent is much more available uh, than it was in the past. There was a time, after all, 600 years ago, where if somebody could read, we'd call him a genius. Or I think what Giannani was saying, he could add and subtract, he must be a genius. <laughs> but we found that uh, our human capacity can develop. Uh, for those of you who are on remotely, uh, we're going to, uh, we're just going to see this clip uh, of the meeting between Lady Catherine and Elizabeth uh, at Longhorn. Uh, just, I think, as, a, as one example uh, that brings out her individuality as a character. And we will resume for our question. Mm -hmm. Pardon me? Ashok, did you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, please, yes. sorry, I should have asked you first. 
Please, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, see your description of charge for air. Visualizing 37 million uh, homers and uh, newtons and uh, moliere like that. What exactly does he mean to convey? I don't get that. Uh, well, I don't know what he meant to convey. I've never read him in the original, but this is a famous quote of his. But I tell him, I quoted it for what I think it conveys to me. I think there's a truth in this. There's no reason why our Homers and Newtons and Moliere, and after all, I think in many areas today, we what was once a, a remarkable, unique capacity is much more common today than in the past. And I think that to me what this statement means, I can't say what he meant by it. To me what it means is there's no reason that as individual, individuality evolves, we can't have many more geniuses than we've had in the past in all fields, in arts, in invention, uh, in, in, in uh, political life, in literature, and in all fields. What we took as unique was unique because there were very few people with those capacities in the past. But as society develops its endowments and more or less develops the capacity to empower individuals the way uh, Alberto's been talking about, I see no reason why uh, these, uh, the genius has to be so uh, limited and unique as in the past. In fact, Ivo and I wrote an article about uh, 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 undiscovered genius, uh, intellectual genius, and trying to argue that the intellectual genius is not just because he's got a big IQ, it's because he has mental processes which go beyond the mechanical, mechanistic, reductionist view that Alberto was talking about. And we can teach young people to be much more capable uh, we can't make people geniuses, but we can give, we can facilitate and empower them and help them learn higher orders uh, of thinking processes that can create, make more geniuses possible. And I, why shouldn't that be true of playwrights and mathematicians and poets as well? Excuse me, Gary, that... Uh your statements uh, bring bring me into problem with my own understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. What you are saying is virtually equal to saying that the geniuses can be mass produced like cars in assembly, cars in automatic assemblies or something. He's, uh, he's saying, what I'm saying sounds like geniuses can be mass produced like cars in an automatic assembly. Okay, and you have a problem with that. Yes, uh, genius by by very definition is a special condition, and you say it can be mass duplicated. Uh, that involves a Country. conflict in understanding. Mm. That's why I said there was a time, literally, it sounds funny to us, but there was a time when somebody who could read was considered a genius. Uh, and now we mass produce <laughs> geniuses for reading. So I think the problem is that we define genius as that rare, unique thing that's one in a million. But maybe it's our conception is wrong, and maybe that's what Fourier meant. Maybe what was once, I mean, after all, at the turn of, in 1900, how many people had cars? In 1900, they were producing only about 10,000 cars a year in the United States, and the only one who could afford a car uh, was a very rich person because they cost about three, four thousand dollars at that time. <laughs> you know the story, within 25 years, Henry Ford was producing a million cars a year. Now in 1900, if somebody should say that I'm going to produce a million cars a year, or they're going to be a million people, Americans a year having cars, uh, anybody would laugh and say that's impossible. They're not going to be a million millionaires in the, uh, in America in 20 years from now. But things of course, change. Yes. Car cannot be so 
easily equated with the mind of a genius. Yes. So the question is, and I think it's a very important question. I'm not making light of it. I think it, it re, what you're expressing really addresses the, the conviction we've all grown up with, or most people have grown up with, that genius is and always will be rare. And one of the things I found very beneficial about the research that we've done for this is that I realized that in many respects, people who have achieved at a very high level, in many respects, are very ordinary people. But, and, uh, but they did have some capacity that enabled them to achieve at such a high level. And if you look at the individual cases and see what enabled them to do it, well, we might ask ourselves, aren't many other people we know capable of learning and acquiring those capacities so they can do it too. So far I have not, I'm leaving aside a Leonardo uh, and a Shakespeare and I'm not passing judgment on these uh, giants of history, but, uh, uh, but surely in principle, say today how many Nobel Prizes do we award uh, uh, six or seven prizes a year, uh, does it really mean there are only six or seven people who are worthy of the prize? Uh, Nobel Foundation is only giving it. If they were giving out 6,000 a, a year, uh, people would lose interest in it. They wouldn't have the prestige and they'd need a lot of money to do that. Does it mean there are 6,000 people uh, who are doing work of, uh, uh, of significance or 60,000? I think that the idea that genius or individuality is something really unique comes from our hero worship of the past. But from what I have learned in our studies, there's nothing to suggest that it need be a rare phenomenon in the future. If it is today, if it has been in the past, it, I think it's less rare today. And a hundred years from now, it may be much more common. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay. A good point. I'm glad you raised it because it's a it's a controversial point. It goes against our the conventional wisdom of the way we think about not only about ourselves but the way we think about people who have achieved at a high level. We idealize them. Uh, we don't treat them as humans. You know, Paul Johnson, the British historian, wrote a book about great intellectuals. Uh, and uh, uh, if you want to lose all your sense of idolization, you read this book and uh, you find out what the, the lives of some of our great intellectuals like Rousseau uh, and, uh, and Byron and all who we, the, we worship and idolize, and you see what their lives were like. You see in many respects that they weren't even uh, average, uh, but we have idealized them, idolized them. Okay? Okay, okay. Thanks for your question. Okay.